So the, I'm going to talk about metallization uh, using cold spray. And I, I don't know how many of you know about cold spray, but I'm assuming some of you might not. So I'll just give you a very short overview of what cold spray is. And what it is, is a, a very kind of deceptively simple idea whereby uh, you have metal powders uh, that are accelerated um, through heated gas, which is pressurized. And um, in this particular case, uh, the gas also carries powder into this nozzle. The nozzle is a De Laval type nozzle. So therefore, the gas goes in and then it goes out uh, accelerated. And you can accelerate the gas and therefore the particles being carried by the gas uh, several um, uh, uh, times the speed of sound. And when the powders hit the substrate, then they can consolidate and bond together. And I should say, this really works best uh, for metals uh, because plastic deformation is the key uh, to um, getting bonding. So that's the process. And uh, here you can get fully dense coatings on impact. So that's very a very fast kinetic for powder consolidation. Uh, the, the bond strengths are very high and uh, you can actually get really thick coatings. So that's another advantage. It, it starts to make the process look viable uh, for additive manufacturing. So cold means relative to normal powder processing routes. So thermal spray, you melt the powder, um, ordinary uh, powder sintering processing takes place at quite high temperatures for very long times in order to do sintering. So cold means it's much, the, the temperatures are much lower than those, but there's still temperature involved. And uh, because it's cold, things like thermal stresses, oxidation, and microstructural changes are minimized or eliminated. And also you can get quite novel properties because it is, a, it is a, an interesting way uh, to consolidate powders. So it's a very interesting process. And uh, we uh, have a cold sprays facility um, which is nearby McGill University. Uh, I was given a grant of a couple of million dollars uh, in about 2007 to build this cold spray facility and in fact uh, it's housed at uh, national research council canada in a place called boucherville which is uh, about 20 kilometers away from mcgill so it's quite quite close by and nrc's boucherville unit is actually pretty much dedicated to thermal spray so there's a lot there was a lot of thermal spray going on and they regarded cold spray as a kind of extrapolation of um, a thermal spray and uh, and they managed to um, house this unit very successfully so that uh, this year we got a new grant in order to extend uh, the capabilities of the original unit to encompass a cold spray centered additive manufacturing cell. So that's exciting. Uh, and so the cold spray facility is at the is at that end of the building. And originally there was one spray booth, but eventually uh, they got two spray booths because it's so uh, popular in terms of industrial usage. So that, that's a, a little bit of advertising, but if we get back to cold spray, it looks simple, but in terms of processing, there's a lot going on. So primarily in terms of processing, uh, we're interested in the gas type, the gas pressure, usually the gas type is nitrogen, but uh, it could be helium or it could even be air. Uh, obviously, there's a gas heater to generate the uh, energy required to accelerate the powders. So temperature of the gas is important. Um, and nozzle design is crucial in terms of the key metric of the process, which is really velocity. So velocity is everything. 
and that all the designs are based on trying to get the highest velocities you can although of course there's a limit to all of that other uh processing uh, conditions that are relatively important a feed rate uh, obviously powder temperature is important uh, standoff distance and uh, traverse speed is also important that kind of finishes off the processing variables but of course the materials are important and so powder characteristics and substrate characteristics round off uh, the complexity of cold spray so uh, I'd just like to briefly talk about the mechanisms of uh, how powder consolidates. So this I call cold sprayability. And uh, we can uh, conveniently center all that uh, conversation into this metric called the critical velocity, uh, velocity. So this is a graph of deposition efficiency versus particle velocity. Deposition efficiency is just the percentage of powder that sticks. So as soon as you get a positive deposition, a percentage, then uh, that's known as the critical velocity. And a lot of people look at this critical velocity uh, that, and, and say, if it's high, then the powder is difficult to cold spray. If it's low, then it's easy. That, of course, is a very simplistic way to look at cold sprayability, but it's quite handy uh, because we can have a look at the things that affect critical velocity. So this is an empirical equation. There's a couple of things missing, but basically the metrics or the variables that are important are density of material, melting point, uh, ultimate strength, and initial particle temperature. So basically, uh, we're looking at things that... Uh, make uh, the powder deform. So either you're generating high impact, so density is important, or you're softening the material. So melting point and strength and particle temperature are obviously all important. In terms of how uh, cold spray uh, bonds, how do the particle bond? Well, there are two uh, accepted mechanisms. Uh, one is metallurgical bonding. So the basic idea, which uh, people have looked at through finite ele element analysis, is that you have to generate, or it seems like it's a good idea to generate a lot of deformation at the interface between in this case, the particle and the substrate, but probably the particle and the coating as well, because you're building up layers. And so people have modeled this and they actually see this. Um, I, I, I have to say that um, not, I would say, not all uh, cold spray uh, processes come up with uh, jetting. This is what this is known as, as clearly as we see here. but. If this happens, and the general idea is you need all kinds of deformation in order to remove the oxide film, and if you do that and you get intimate contact between uh, the two metal, clean metal surfaces, then you can develop primary metallic bonding or you know, coulombic forces. So that's one method. Of course, that only works when you have metal and metal. Obviously, this isn't going to work if you have a polymer substrate. But when subsequent buildup of layers will maybe have metallic bonding uh, assisting uh, the consolidation of the coating. The other method is just physical interlocking. Here's uh, a kind of schematic of uh, surfaces that have generated some sort of pattern. This is a kind of uh, simulation of what happens when they explosively form nickel on nickel. So the, you get these kind of patterns that interlock, but it might be just as simple as rough, roughness and asperities interlocking on each other. So those are the two main methods of um, bonding. And I think that finishes off my quick overview on cold spray. So now let, let me get to the subject, which is metallization of polymers. And we did this for lightning strike protection, and this is what we, we've kind of continued doing. So the, the kind of emphasis is on lightning strike protection. And I think it's important, the application is important 
because if we were thinking of let's say wear resistance then maybe would we would have thought of some other things to do but because it was lightning strike protection i think this is why we kind of went this way uh so like i said that's uh important to know and uh just a quicker you probably realize that this happens but a lot of aircraft uh, especially the big ones now have a lot of um, polymer usually carbon fiber reinforced polymer so it's great in terms of a lightweight and strength but of course uh, the co conductivity is low compared to aluminum which was obviously the competing material and in fact aircraft get struck quite often uh, although I, I wouldn't worry too much uh, because I think one aircraft can get struck I don't know five times uh, during a year so the likelihood of getting struck is quite low but when it does strike you have problems of heat management you have impact problems and you can damage um, the fuselage of the wing so that so people are worried about that and so metallization of the polymer is a way to do it i think the current process is to embed a copper mesh into the uh, the cfrp of course that increases the weight and also um, if the plane actually gets struck and there's damage it's very complicated repairing cfrp especially if you have copper mesh in it so the idea of a coating is slightly better because if the coating is lost then you can always recoat although that obviously isn't as simple as it sounds either but that that's one of the ideas i think the other idea of uh, a coating is that maybe you can protect certain parts of the aircraft that may be more vulnerable to lightning strike than others but anyway uh, it's been thought about and if we're thinking about coatings then a cold spray is a fairly good idea uh, firstly because if you compare it to thermal spray um, the oxidation of the coating is much lower the risk of it is lower and that'll improve conductivity because oxides increase resistivity and also you have less uh, a possibility of heat damage uh, to the polymer substrate although of course you might have damage due to impact uh, if you're throwing powders at uh, high velocity so uh, as always with processes there are good things and there are bad things and you know who knows which process is going to win but i like uh, cold spray so uh, the initial experiments uh, we tried ages ago this was work that han ching che did he started my uh, work or our work into metallization and so he looked at uh, the usual feedstock materials so aluminum uh, it's light it's reasonable in terms of conductivity and it's not bad in terms of spray sprayability especially pure aluminum uh, high strength aluminum is a bit more problematic but pure aluminum is pretty easy so this is just uh, uh, the photograph or the, the powder um, that we used and some details of the PSD. Uh, copper obviously comes up because it's got high conductivity and it also has a very good cold spray ability. It's, the, it's really one of the go-to materials for cold spray. And here we use a spherical as well as irregular the, as if if you know much about cold spray you know that there could be some advantages of irregular copper i think you can get a, maybe higher deposition efficiencies or lower critical velocities so it was something that we were thinking about because we were already envisaging problems to to do with um, velocity problems so with tin um tin's been used for polymers so we thought that that was also uh, something viable in terms of using uh, the feedstock as our initial uh, foray into the subject uh, 
So we started off using high pressure cold spray. So there's high and low pressure. High pressure tends to, it will give you higher velocities, tends to be more versatile. Uh, the substrate that we used was a CFRP from Bombardier, which hopefully you know is a company uh, that uh, makes aircraft in, in Quebec. And um, the uh, usual thing about uh, CFRPs right now is that the uh, polymer is a thermoset, it's an epoxy. And uh, you'll realize that this is the thing that gives us a bit of a problem initially. So the system that we use is actually a Japanese system, the plasma Geekin system, and we use nitrogen. Uh, so these are the uh, processing conditions. So we went up to quite high temperatures for copper. Um, and uh, of course, we had to be careful about temperatures for aluminum and tin because of melting and, and also clogging. <laughs> so um, the first efforts weren't very good. Um, here you actually see the copper effort. And what you see is just a lot of damage. Um, and if you look at the cross section, you can see the odd copper particle embedded. Uh, there's a closer version of it here, but you can also see damage of the substrate. You can even see uh, the carbon fiber fractured. And we had the same problem with aluminum. So again, damage, again, the odd particle embedded, but not a good coating. Tin, we got a kind of an intermittent coating. So here you can see signs of a, an effort at coating, but again, it didn't work. And again, you can see erosion. So you see that, uh, that you know, this kind of wavy thing is signs that erosion has occurred. So uh, the problem was obviously erosion. And so if we go back to this idea of critical velocity, this is great for ductile materials. So you get a critical velocity, you can have a decent window of deposition, which exists over a fair uh, velocity range, but then eventually uh, the velocity comes high enough uh, to have erosion. And at some point, uh, the rate of erosion uh, beats uh, the rate of deposition and you just get material loss, net material loss. So in ductile materials, the velocities where you start getting erosion are actually really high. And I, do, I don't honestly think we get, we reach that when we're looking at things like aluminum, copper, titanium, and so forth. With brittle materials, unfortunately, you generally don't get deposition at all because erosion is always happening before you get deposition. And so, unfortunately, thermosetting epoxy, which is the polymer in CFRP, is brittle and it's exhibiting, uh, I would say, classic erosion problems. So when you look at, have a quick look at erosion, it's a function of velocity. So if you reduce the velocity, uh, you reduce the amount, so the rate of erosion. And the other thing we note is that harder particles are worse. That's pretty obvious. So clearly we need a softer particle, which tends to be a lower melting point particle, not necessarily, but it tends to be. And so then, uh, if we're using softer and lower melting point, we have to be careful of nozzle clogging, uh, which is the kiss of death for cold spray. So you don't want to get into too high temperatures when you're using these, uh, these softer materials. So that left us with thinking about trying to maybe avoid clogging. So you notice here that the powder is delivered uh, before it gets to the constriction in the Delaval type nozzle. Uh, there's another type of feed where you can feed the powder in after the constriction. And, uh, and luckily, there's a company in uh, Canada called Centerline who makes exactly that type of equipment. It's low pressure and there's this so-called downstream injection. So we did a lot of our work on that system, although the, there is a there are other competing um, low pressure systems. So again, so now we're using tin, and uh, we're looking at the the temperature is obviously uh, quite low. I should uh, remind you or let you know that the melting point of uh, tin is around about two hundred and thirty. 
a centigrade or Celsius. So 325 is already a bit much. And uh, the pressures that we use were low to quite high. This is entering high pressure territory. So that, so that was the processing. And out of this, we actually got successful tin coatings, obviously. Otherwise, if we, did, if we didn't, I wouldn't be talking to you. So here we have uh, at 300 degrees centigrade um, at various pressures. So we notice that at 45 PSI, the coating is pretty intermittent. The other thing to look out for is the interface between the coating and the substrate, and it's quite smooth. At 60 PSI, uh, there's a very thick coating or much thicker, and you can see that the interface is now a little bit more um, uh, broken up or rougher. At 80 PSI, uh, the thickness went down and uh, the um, damage to the substrate is much increased. And at 150 PSI, there was a lot of damage at the interface and the coating isn't very good at all. So, of course, all of this matches in terms of deposition efficiency. So we can certainly say that you seem to need a bit of damage at the interface in order to get a good coating. But it's a really small window of opportunity because as soon as you have too much damage, then uh, deposition efficiency drops. So out of this, there are conditions where you get good tin coatings, but they seem to be very tight. So in terms of a process match, which is in terms of temperature versus pressure, very high temperatures, you risk clogging. So we were reluctant to go above 300, really. Um, and uh, if you go too low, then the particles are too hard and they'll just bounce off or they'll erode. So then in the middle of all of this, there's the possibility of coating. So uh, at this boundary in front, before you get to this um, boundary, so at velocities that are relatively low, uh, then what you get is no deposition. And that's partly because the critical velocity isn't reached or it may be because there's erosion. Uh, on this side of the boundary, there's no coating either, and that's basically because you've got a lot of erosion uh, because the velocities are pretty high at this side. So in the middle, there's a, a possibility of deposition, but even then, to get a good coating, uh, the, the region or the window is very small. So this was the window uh, hovering uh, close to 300, which is some way, this is a gas temperature, right? The particle temperature isn't necessarily three, 300. Obviously, if it was, it would be molten, but that's the range of gas temperature. And if we, if we actually went away from that region, we would get discontinuous coatings. So like, as you can see, it's a very kind of narrow operating window uh, that uh, that tin was able to coat at. Um, if we have a look at the microstructure or the details of the coating, so this is at 290, and uh, what you can see is a kind of speckled appearance on this coating. You can see uh, kind of whole particles that don't really look like they're deformed. And there's regions that look kind of deformed. But one of the interesting things was this um, uh, speckled or small uh, detailed uh, spheroids on top of the big spheres. And if you did a cross section, you could see things that look kind of like a melted region at the surface. And uh, definitely we think that's melted. So obviously some melting had taken place. And if you look at the particles before cold spray, then you can see that they're smooth and there's none of this kind of rough, melt, uh, rough region uh, in the cross section either. So some melting has occurred. So that gave us this idea of the mechanism of coating that a uh, hanching uh, calls the crack filling mechanism. And, and really this concept is the thing that we carry on uh, throughout the rest of the work. So the idea is you initially get a bit of softening or possibly even melting of the particles on the outer surface. And so this still has a solid core. 
And so when this um, type of material hits the substrate, then the solid core can generate some damage, which are cracks. And then maybe the cracks are filled either by plastic deformation or maybe by the molten layer. So this is uh, how the first layer of the coating is formed. And then the rest of the layers are something to do with how the particles interact with each other. So the crack filling method is really uh, the interaction between the powder and the polymer substrate. So that was the, uh, that was the general mechanism that Hanching thought uh, was uh, fulfilling a deposition. And here's uh, uh, some validation of this where you can see uh, penetration of uh, the, um, the coating some way into the substrate. If we look at deposition efficiency, this is at 60 psi and we vary the temperature. You can see there's a great big jump from 290 to 300. And uh, let's not forget that the melting point of tin is somewhere here. But you know, the kinetics of things, you know, probably the that this is where the melting takes place. So it is interesting to see a, a pretty big jump. And we couldn't really see any kind of difference between uh, the, the, the surfaces at these temperatures. And let's face it, there's only 10 degrees difference. So uh, I would have been shocked to see anything particularly different going on. Uh, so we, we haven't quite figured out why 290 to 300 gives you this giant uh, increase in deposition efficiency, but there it is. <clears throat> if we looked at um, the effect of pressure, so this is deposition efficiency at 300 degrees centigrade ver versus a, a variety of pressures. Then it, the first thing you might be thinking of is, why did we look at 300? Why didn't we look at 310 or even higher? And like I said, we were really worried about clogging. It did happen. So we, get, we just kept to 300 degrees centigrade. That was very reliable. You didn't get clogging at that point. Um, and so what you can see is that, again, there's a great big leap, right, from 42 to 50 and then 50 to 60, uh, there's a big leap and we're assuming this is obviously something to do with increasing velocity. So, you know, this is the critical velocity, et cetera, et cetera. However, one other thing to notice about all of this is that when you look at this, this is 20%, right? So the deposition efficiency of tin is really low. I mean, this is a very low deposition efficiency. I think we like to see things like 90%. So this was distressingly low. And so we, we, pro we thought, well, this is probably because the velocity is too low, right? But so then you think, okay, increase the velocity. But if you do that, in this case, you do it by increasing the pressure, then suddenly uh, the deposition efficiency goes down. And so we think this is an erosion problem. So your problem is the velocity is a bit low in terms of getting high deposition efficiency, but if you increase it, you're going to get erosion. So we, we tr the next phase of the work was really to try to improve the deposition efficiency. So, so I would say this ends um, phase one. So the conclusions of phase one is erosion is the problem for CFRP. Tin's good because it's got low strength and melting may well be an important part of the mechanism, but the processing window is small and the deposition efficiency is very low because we think of insufficient velocity. But if you have a higher velocity, then you'll get erosion. So that's where we left it at phase one. So at this point, let's see if anybody's got any questions. Nobody has any questions. So again, if you haven't you, taken the QR code, this is a good opportunity for you to do it. And if you want to ask questions during the next bits of my talk, then that's great. Right, so, uh, so what happens next? We want to improve uh, deposition efficiency. So we go back to the cold sprayability equation. And there's a number of things you can think of uh, that might be helpful. But what we looked at was 
melting point. So according to this equation, and it makes sense, if you increase the melting point, or then the critical velocity goes up. So maybe we can try alloys which have lower melting points than tin, or maybe we can make tin alloy tin and make it have a lower melting point. And there's lots of those because tin is the basis for electrical solders. And solders uh, obviously work at very low temperatures. So we looked at two uh, low melting point alloys, tin zinc, so here's the binary phase diagram for tin zinc. So this is uh, zinc uh, at this end. This is tin here. And you can see a eutectic there, with, uh, which doesn't need too much zinc uh, to achieve. And we also looked at uh, tin bismuth tin or tin bismuth, but it eventually became bismuth tin. And here you can see uh, a eutectic here as well. So if you, if you follow the eutectic temperatures, uh, then you can see that you can get pretty close to 200 degrees C. So that's a 20 or 30 degree de decrease from pure tin. But with the bismuth tin, you can get down to 138, which is miles away from 226. Uh, so this will be interesting uh, to look at. So the powders that we got, we got them from a company called 5N Plus, who make solders, and they make solders in powder form. So this is very convenient, and they were very eager to see what their powders would do. So this is the tin zinc one, um, and I think it contains about 10% zinc. And this is the powder, oh, this is the pure tin, sorry. This is the, the tin zinc one, and it looks the same. Uh, the size distribution is not too far away. And this is the tin bismuth. So here you can probably see that we're very close to the eutectic composition. And you can see the powders are slightly smaller, but I don't think that makes any difference in this exercise. So one thing to uh, remember or to be careful about is that um, the idea is the crack uh, filling mechanism. So you need cracks. So you still need kind of solid material maybe. And so that's where you have to worry about hardness. And although alloying decreases the melting point, alloying will increase the hardness and that's exactly what happened so even the addition of 10 percent zinc uh, actually drastically increased the hardness of tin and you can imagine what a lot of bismuth did although it's more like a bismuth alloy than a tin alloy and here you have a very high um, hardness compared to that of tin so that's something to keep in uh, thinking about as we go through the results so we measure the temperature melting points by DSC, very simple method. So like I said, tin has got a melting point close to 230. And these are the scans for the tin zinc and the tin bismuth. So the tin zinc uh, had 212, so not a, a fairly modest uh, decrease in melting point. And as you'd imagine, the tin bismuth had a very spectacular decrease in melting point of about 150 degrees centigrade, or really more or less exactly 150. So what happened in terms of deposition efficiency? Uh, so here we have deposition efficiency versus gas pressure. And so the upper curves, uh, so we actually sprayed two substrates. One was steel and as a point of reference and the other turned out to be abs polymer so abs polymer isn't uh isn't nominally as brittle as cfrp but nevertheless uh, you'll find out that it's not as strong as you might think it could be so anyway we have two um substrates and we have two spray temperatures and we're looking at the effect of pressure so this is at 300 degrees centigrade, that's steel, and this is ABS. So strangely enough, at uh, a pressure of 40, the deposition efficiencies are identical. I think that's a coincidence. I don't see why they should be identical. But then as you increase pressure, 
uh, which means increasing velocity, steel behaves kind of normally in the sense that the, uh, the deposition efficiency kind of goes up, although it does level off. But with ABS, uh, things go down. Um, so this is at 200 degrees centigrade. Let me just get back to the ABS behavior. So we think that this is due to erosion. So the so increasing velocity should kind of increase deposition efficiency, but it doesn't, and we think this is due to erosion. If we go to 200 degrees centigrade, both the steel and the ABS substrates are behaving in the same way. Um, and so the interesting thing is, why don't we get erosion of the ABS like we did before? And I think the reason for this is the velocities are relatively low. So at 200 degrees, the velocities are going to go down, even though you're trying to increase the velocity with pressure. And so what, we, what I think at 200 is that the velocity is too low for erosion, and so deposition just dominates. So there's an increase in deposition as you increase the velocity, but the deposition efficiency is pretty low. So uh, 200 is a low velocity. At least you don't get erosion, but you don't get much deposition either. So that's tin. If we look at tin zinc, then it looks kind of similar. And the, the reason for that is, of course, the melting points are kind of similar. There's only a 20 degrees C difference, so everything looks similar. But nevertheless, you do get an improvement in deposition efficiency. So the deposition efficiency can go up to about 20% or 22%, whereas we're down here at around about 12 or 15%. So even a 20 degrees C change or decrease in melting point is good. Um, in terms of the, uh, the tin bismuth or the bismuth tin, this is obviously 200 degrees C, and I should mention that this is ABS. But basically, you've got uh, a similar deposition efficiency as you were seeing before, although the behavior is different. And I think that might be because there's a slight change in the mechanism. Uh, don't, uh, I should point out that the, um, uh, the, the zoom or the, the magnification of the uh, y-axis is different. So this is twice uh, the magnification of this. So it's a little bit deceptive. But basically, the deposition efficiencies here are kind of similar to what you see um, in the other two uh, metals, but uh, maybe a little bit higher. But the, but the um, characteristics as you change pressure are very, quite different. If you go to the high temperature, then you get a really spectacular increase in deposition efficiency. So obviously, uh, the red is ABS and the blue again is steel. And so at the ABS, you've now got things like 60% deposition efficiency as opposed to around about 20%. And the steel, uh, you're getting 100%. The, one of the interesting things here is that now you've got a separation between the two. Where, so before they were always the same. And the other thing that's happening is that when you increase the pressure, although admittedly, we're only increasing it once from 40 to 60, then both uh, the steel substrate and the ABS behave in the same way, which starts making me think uh, that there's a different uh, bonding mechanism occurring with the tin bismuth system versus the other two systems. So if we look at uh, the surface of the coating, so this is tin, tin zinc, and this is at 200, then what you see is on the tin and tin zinc, they look the same. Uh, they're kind of um, featureless in a way, although you can see some particles that haven't deformed and you can see others that have deformed. But with the tin bismuth, you can start seeing this kind of roughening effect, which we said was characteristic of um, melting. So even at 200 degrees, we're getting a bit of melting of the tin bismuth, and I suppose that's giving you a little bit of improvement in some aspects of deposition efficiency, but not a lot. And I think there's not a lot of improvement 
uh, because of the hardness. So I think uh, because the hardness of the tin bismuth is pretty high, I think erosion's taking place and that's making um, things difficult at 200. If we go to 300, then we find that they've all kind of got uh, the features of melting, and you really, you can't really see any massive difference between the tin bismuth and the other two, although I guess if you looked hard enough, maybe there is something, but really they kind of look the same. So, so we're thinking, well, I don't, this doesn't really help us explain why uh, this coating has got so much higher deposition efficiency. But if you look at the coating cross sections at 300, then the tin one is characteristic of what I'd call kind of normal behavior, where you can see um, uh, remains, if you like, of the, uh, the uh, tin powder particles. Uh, most of it hasn't been heavily deformed. And you can even see the boundaries between the particles, which kind of signifies that maybe the velocity is a bit low uh, in terms of consolidation. Uh, but when you look at the tin bismuth, you don't see those features. What you see uh, is um, the two-phase uh, microstructure that you would get because it's a eutectoid composition and you'll have quite a lot of the two phases there. The other thing that's noticeable is that this is a very smooth interface compared to the interface there. So we don't, so when you, and when you zoom into here, then you don't see any sign of um, boundaries of the particles. So what we think is happening here is that the tin bismuth has kind of melt, melted completely. And what we're getting here is a kind of thermal spray mechanism as opposed to the crack filling mechanism. So I think that that might help explain things. But where, if we summarize our efforts on lowering the melting point, I definitely think it works. Um, if you have fully molten particles, it's really good. But uh, is that a good thing? Is it helpful? It's hard to know. And is it cold spray anymore? Maybe not. And uh, OK. Oh. So is tin, so thanks for the questions, is tin okay for lightning as its melting point is low? So uh, we um, actually, at the end of Hanchin's work, he did uh, do a lightning strike simulation. Now, the, we didn't simulate it all because there's kind of three cycles to it. There's this initial cycle, we have an impact and, the, you know, a sudden increase in, um, uh, voltage or current, but we did manage to simulate the middle part, which is kind of um, a, a large, I would say, fraction of the uh, lightning strike um, process, and the, the tin didn't show any signs of anything, and even after we uh, tested, um, we we applied the current so we, we did the, the lightning strike simulation at one of the other universities who has a rig to do lightning strike. Uh, then the, the tin coating survived. And when we did things like adhesion testing, it didn't look like uh, the tin had, the coating had deteriorated. So the adhesion strength hadn't changed. So, so it can withstand that simulation. Can it withstand everything i mean t i think you can probably realize tin's not the greatest metal you know it it could suffer from wear but in terms of that simulation of lightning it was it was good it worked is it possible to change pressure dynamically matt well you know what <laughs> if it what you mean during cold spray i think i really like that idea we can't i would say we can't do it right now. Are we thinking about doing it? I don't know, but I think that's an awfully good idea. And uh, you know, if you if you get round to doing it, let me know. But we're, I'm going to try to propose that. But I do think that's a very good idea. Oh, when you measure DE, is incubation time an issue? So I'm assuming you mean, do we get to steady state or something like that? And the answer is we never get to steady state. Yes, it's an issue, uh, but but 
um you i don't know if you know this but uh in our um system which are kind of industrial strength you know they're industrially based you need an awful lot of powder just to do um one uh coating so it, and uh, and then if you wanted to do steady state you you it would be like several kilograms of powder to get there so yeah it's a, it's an issue we uh i i don't think we'd thought about um um uh, making accommodations for it right but we so we haven't done that uh and i don't and nobody's really thinking about it but certainly when it comes to the you know transferring the process to industry uh then then you know you kind of have to think about those issues but right now we haven't done that so why mix tin with bismuth bit, just to lower the melting point see so remember you know with powder with powder technology one of the problems is you're kind of stuck with the powders that are out there right you you i can't make my own powders and even if i could we'd need a lot of powder so it turns out bismuth is a great um is is one of the go-to things uh, to make a very low melting point solder so it just so happens that we we didn't mix tin with bismuth 5n plus did and we took the powder Oh, what is the required film thickness? That is a very good question, and we haven't thought about that either. We, what we think is, and, and so th this is where um, you have to start getting down to the nitty gritty of um, the of the engineering application. So, what what as a materials person or a group? All we've said is, is it possible to cold spray something? And so it is. And is it possible to build at the thickness? And yes, it is. So now, of course, you, what we want to do is, what is the minimum thickness that you need? Because obviously you don't want to weigh down the aircraft. So I think we're good in terms of having a thickness that will do the job. Now we'd like to know what is the minimum required thickness. And I think that's a very good question. And there's a way to do that. We need electrical engineers working on the problem. Uh, but basically, yeah, that was, uh, that's a good question. Um, so for lightning strike application, so uh, let's have a look. If CFVP was eroded a bit, right. How about its applicability? Yeah. So we we actually uh, looked at um, the damage. We looked at the damage in in terms of bend strength, right? So when we did uh, the cold spray coating, we we checked the bend strength of the substrate, and it looked it didn't look like it had been damaged. So um, at this point, uh, the the tin coating seems to be okay. Uh, but yeah, we, we, you definitely need more testing in that respect. So for lightning applications, what is necessary conditions of bonding strength? I don't know. So the here, again, here, what we do, what you need to do is you need to run it through the application. So certainly the application is lightning, but then there's the simple application of if you stick it on an aircraft, is it going to last? Because you've got things like erosion, you've you've probably got stresses and strains going on. Is the tin gonna to stand uh, the you know the uh, process? And so that's probably the next step to do. Uh, I've talked about the required thickness. Is there any chemical reaction? We don't think so. We haven't seen anything. I don't think the tin reacts with the CFRP. Okay, so thanks a lot for those. Let's go to the next bit. So we, low melting point seems to do stuff. So an, a, a thought came, why don't we, instead of having an alloy, you know, tin, zinc, why don't we just do what people would normally term as in situ alloying and just mix powders together right so in so we instead of making a tin zinc alloy we just add a bit of tin 10 percent zinc powder 
to the tin and then see whether we get something happening in terms of maybe some kind of uh, melting happening at the interface between the tin and the zinc and let's see whether that does anything. So that's what we did. We did, uh, we added tin powder with zinc powder and we also added tin with copper for other reasons. But this is the tin, tin powder, 90% tin plus 10% zinc powder. And I think this is by weight. And luckily, uh, the atomic masses of tin and zinc are quite close together, I think, on the periodic table. So anyway, that, that was approximately what we did. The other details I can't remember are the powders the same size. I think they were roughly similar. Anyway, so we did the coating. So this is tin. This is at 280 degrees centigrade. This is at 60 psi. Uh, so remember, 60 is you know one of the, the 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 pressure that was good. 300 is the pressure is the temperature that gave the best tin coating. So this is what happened with pure tin. So it's just a kind of repeat of what I've shown you before. But when you add 10% zinc, then uh, lo and behold. Uh, the um, uh, the deposition efficiency improves, uh, and in fact, it's kind of better than even uh, the 300 degrees tin one. So you you're hoping things are even better at 300, and they are. So so the 10 percent thing seemed to be like uh, kind of a really good idea. Um, we also had a look at tin copper. There, there was a kind of general idea that copper would be good uh, because of conductivity, but of course it doesn't quite work out that way uh, because you know the copper is uh, a, a low volume fraction and uh, etc. But copper is probably better than tin in a lot of ways, and so again we reproduce what we did here before. So this is. Uh, tin, pure tin, and this is what happens at 300. We also did something at 350 degrees centigrade, uh, but again, we got good results. So adding 10% copper really improved the deposition efficiency. Um, so in here, we, add, we started getting bolder and we added 30% copper and then 50. And unfortunately, uh, it decreased the deposition efficiency. So adding more copper above 10 copper wasn't very beneficial. And uh, you, there was a similar approach here, even though we didn't show the tin 10 copper. I don't know why we didn't do that. But basically, if you add more copper, it's not a good idea. Right, so that's good. So we know uh, that you can get an eutectic um, in uh, when you mix with zinc, uh, but with copper, it was a slight bit of a surprise. You can see that this is this is a cross section. We were using um, irregular copper, so we don't we don't see nice spherical copper part particles, and the irregular copper may well be part of the reason why we're getting better. Um, um, deposition efficiencies when we add copper. So it's not just about melting, if it is about melting at all. But again, you can see these bits here, right? And so when we analyze these particles, they were actually an intermetallic of copper and tin. And if you look at the copper tin phase diagram, there is the intermetallic, it's a phase. And so clearly, uh, the liquid tin had, had interacted with the copper, and uh, maybe that uh, is beneficial in terms of um, improving the deposition efficiency. But like I said, um, melting point isn't the only thing that happens when you add a second component or an SC to you know the major component or the matrix. We, our group has done quite a lot of work on mixing powders. And we do know that when you mix powders, you can do things in terms of deposition efficiency and porosity. You can improve things or you can make them worse. So uh, in our previous studies, uh, but before that, let's have a look at deposition efficiency of tin copper. Like I said, we got um, a kind of maximum at 10 and then it started going down like that.
So if we look at uh, the cross sections, um, then uh, at the 10% copper, we're seeing this type of thing. And at the 50%, we're seeing this type of thing. And I think you probably agree that we seem to be seeing more of these uh, intermetallic particles, these molten particles. So, and that's not surprising because we got more copper. So there's more copper tin interface, um, but it, it hasn't improved things. In fact, things have got worse. So although uh, maybe it's better to have more of these molten, these interactions between tin and copper, in fact, what we're thinking is that if you add more copper, you get a decrease. And we think this decrease is because there's more interaction between the copper and copper particles. And because the velocity is so low, when if you get copper and copper interacting, they're not going to bond. They're going, going to uh, bounce off each other. And we think that's why the deposition efficiency goes down. You need to really... Uh, maximize the tin copper interaction and you might say oh well surely that's maximized when you have 50 50 but that's only if you have a very homogeneous mixture if you have a random mixture then you'll have clumps of copper interacting with copper and we think that is why um, increasing copper doesn't uh, improve matters in terms of deposition efficiency. Although why 10 copper is great is another quantitative mystery. So like I said, there are other ways in which secondary components can improve matters. And so the main parameters that can assist um, deposition efficiency when it comes to mixing powders is density. Uh, so uh, in uh, this experiment, we varied the density of the secondary component from 2.7 to about 9 and hardness. So we uh, changed it from 7 to 340. So that's quite a big change in hardness. But, you know, is, is a one gram per centimeter cubed change in density equivalent to... 100 HV, nobody knows. I mean, we don't know what equivalences are happening here. We also looked at the effect of morphology. Like I said, irregular particles might make a difference. And also, we obviously looked at particle size because you never know your luck. And it's something that we can kind of control. So we did this by adding uh, this variety of powder alloys, so pure aluminum, 500, 600, and 700 series aluminum, uh, titanium commercially pure, 6.4, and this is uh, commercially pure iron, stainless steel, 316L, and finally copper. So we did a lot of experiments, and so uh, long story short, this is the effect of each uh, variable on uh, deposition efficiency so that's hardness uh, this is density uh, this is morphology factor irregular versus spherical and this is particle size the d50 and uh, basically it's pretty random and the only thing that kind of made sense was hardness so there was the cl kind of clearest trend in the sense that there was a kind of trend so basically, uh, you can see that this is pure tin is 15% or something like that. So anything above 15% is a positive. And so you're getting a lot of um, improvement of hard with hardnesses of this sort of level, uh, kind of lowish hardnesses. And so the general idea was that you need the hardness of the secondary component close to the substrate the idea being that this would make uh, cracking, you know, damaging the cracks that you need to fulfill the uh, crack filling mechanism easier to produce, so you can produce more of them, but without erosion. So you don't want erosion, you just want a few more cracks. So that's, that's what we think. We think that uh, if you have a hardness relatively close uh, to the... Um, substrate, then that's a good thing. 
Uh, right, so let's have a look. Are there any new questions? I think I'm supposed to get rid of old questions. Um, uh, uh, so, when metal particles contact with carbon fibers, yeah. That, that is an excellent question, and we, <clears throat> we haven't got there yet. So, as you, so again, this is, you, you, these, these become enabling factors, right? And, so, and uh, it, th this is a matter of taste. Do you start worrying about this right away, or do you worry about it when you say, yeah, I've got a really good coating, now what? And the answer is, I think, a bit of both. I think that now, now we're getting more, I would say, confident about the possibility that maybe it is time to explore these other uh, factors uh, that uh, people could worry about. Yeah, effective curvature. Uh, so, another excellent question. Cold spray is very good on flat surfaces, right? Brilliant. But with cold surface, curved surfaces, I think you're going to need robots, right? You're going to need robotic control. Mind you, right now we've got robotic control when we're doing the spray, but complex, complex structures are going to be a challenge for um, cold spray in general. But curvature, I think we can deal with. But if, you, if we're thinking about really complicated bits with very abrupt... Um, uh, curves and you know steps that's that definitely another question and unfortunately that might be where you actually need those coatings so again that's an another thing that you need need to be thinking about but in any case that that is something that needs to be thought about when applying cold spray anyway so it's a it's a thing that people are kind of looking at right okay thanks so now let's turn to surface conditioning. So uh, is there any, so we've talked about cracks, right? So then we think, well, can we pre-crack? You know, can you, can you do things like that? Will it help? And so right now, um, when you conventionally cold spray metals, you roughen the surface by grit blasting. Uh, and obviously it works, so that works. So would it work for polymers, CFRPs? So you're, you probably already realize that grit blasting a polymer is a bit severe, and it does cause a lot of damage. People have looked at it, we'll, we'll look at it in this little section. Uh, so what we did was, we did a number, a couple of surface preparation methods. We looked at plasma, we did uh, hot plasma and cold plasma, but it didn't do anything. So plasma did nothing in terms of improving things. We thought about laser patterning, so we thought about uh, using laser ablation to control uh, the patterns and have very fine patterns, but that turns out to be very difficult, it's, it's a bit random. But we managed to get uh, a regular pattern by indirectly using the laser pattern generated on a metal by this method which we call hot pressing. So in terms of mechanical treatment, we actually hot pressed a laser pattern, a metal surface onto some polymers to see whether it would have any effect. So this is the, uh, the, the process by which we generated uh, the, the uh, metal, which became the dye, if you like. So um, uh, this is with Professor Anne Keatsig's lab in chemical engineering in uh, McGill. So she made um, a dye, uh, which had this laser patterning on titanium sheet. This is what it looks like uh, under the SEM, and it's still higher magnifications, so it's very small. Uh, you know, it's um, micron size, and it's uh, very uh, well controlled. So what we did was we transferred that pattern by hot pressing, so very simple apparatus, steel dyes that were heated in this hot press machine, and uh, we looked at ABS, polymer, peak, and CFRP. And uh, th this is the glass transition temperatures, of course, Epoxy doesn't really have a glass transition because it's a thermoset, but you know it softens up at about that temperature. Uh, 
So certainly for the thermoplastics, uh, the temperature pressing was based on the glass transition temperature, as were the pressures. But in any case, um, we managed to get reasonably good patterns on ABS as well as peak, but the patterns on CFRP were poor, especially where the regions were exposed in terms of fibers. So we kind of stopped the work on CFRP in terms of these patterns. Uh, the roughness measurements revealed that we could transfer some of the roughness uh, onto um, the polymer, but quite a lot of it was lost. And when we finally did the cold spray, we used uh, low pressure tin again, and basically we sprayed the whole ABS polymer and the peak polymer, but we kept studying ABS. And basically we looked at this in terms of adhesion. So we did pull-off tests and uh, the adhesion strength was very poor, 3.5 megapascals. And when we looked at the fractured surfaces, this is the polymer side, then interestingly enough, uh, this uh, uh, surface seems to be a mixture of sub polymer substrate and coating. In other words, there seems to be a mixture of adhesion um, as well as cohesion. So the coating failed uh, as well as the uh, substrate coming away from the coating. So that was a bit weird. And even weirder is that it's like 50-50. So 50% of this is uh, coating uh, failure, cohesive failure, and 50% of it seems to be adhesive strength. Now one thing uh, to say about this picture is that this bit is the pattern surface. So this bit doesn't have any pattern, so you can see there's virtually no difference between uh, patterned and unpatterned, and even when we did it quantitatively, there's like no difference. 1% difference is nothing. So uh, in terms of laser patterning, you can transfer those patterns by hot pressing, but there was pretty a small to no effect of that pattern and we thought maybe the pattern's too fine maybe it's too shallow let's have a look at something bigger and deeper and so there we did a little bit more work on the hot press uh, in terms of uh, looking well we looked directly at grit blasting but we also looked at hot pressing surfaces that had been cold sprayed and surfaces that had been grit blasted so what i mean is if we look at grip blasting, we just grip blasted uh, ABS surfaces, and that's what they look like at the end. The white particles are remnants of the grit. And in hot pressing, we started off with grit blasted steel, and then we pressed that surface into ABS, and it kind of looks pretty good. So I think we were able to capture um, the details of this. Uh, by hot pressing, and you can even see that a lot of the roughness is also uh, retained in the pressed ABS. And the same thing with the cold sprayed coating. This is a cold sprayed copper coating uh, with this type of roughness. It was a lot rougher than the grit blasted steel. And again, we managed to uh, retain a lot of that roughness into the ABS. And here, we actually managed to get some sort of effect on uh, the tin coatings. So again, when we're looking at the thickness of the coating, this is sort of equivalent to deposition efficiency. Then what we can see is that there is an increase in thickness or a change in thickness. Uh, and there's certainly influences of things at the interface too. Um, and notice that uh, the thickest coating, which presumably is the best deposition efficiency, came about from the directly grit blasted ABS. But the coating quality is very poor, uh, and uh, we imagine that the uh, adhesion of this coating wouldn't be very good either. So, is there a relationship between deposition efficiency and uh, and uh, roughness and the answer is that there's kind of this is a roughness metric SA and it says that initially uh, increasing roughness is beneficial maybe that's something to do with 
you know, the crack filling mechanism, maybe it's not, maybe it's something to do with particles just being able to cling better onto a roughened surface. However, as you increase the roughness, then uh, the thickness goes down. So uh, deposition efficiency decreases when you actually have too much roughness, even though that's nothing to do with erosion. And uh, we don't know why this is, but maybe it's something to do with angular impact. So you, you realize that most of the, the adhesion is maximized when the particle hits a flat surface. And if it starts hitting angles, I think the energy is kind of transferred into moving the particle as opposed to uh, plastically deforming the particle. So maybe that was a problem. Unfortunately, adhesion was a bit of a shock. So this is a coating thickness versus adhesion. So in terms of the untreated surface, uh, the adhesion was this level, 7 megapascals. But as soon as you roughen the surface, then the adhesion strength dropped like a rock. It dropped to half. There's no real correlation between roughness, but, but basically anything that's roughened is going to give you a poor adhesion. We don't really know why this is. Maybe it's because we're not getting the crack filling mechanism anymore uh, because we don't need cracks for deposition. And maybe you needed those fine cracks in order to have good uh, adhesion between the coating and the uh, particles. Um, so, any questions? What is the adhesion strength of the, so that was the, so this varies, right? So um, there you notice that it was seven megapascals, but it, but it depends on, um, you know, the substrate and what you're doing uh, in terms of um, the various things that we were trying to do. But I, I would say seven is, a, is about as good as it's going to get with tin. That, that's my kind of rough idea, my rough thoughts. Uh, for, almost last but not least, we went to hybrid coating. So why do, what does hybrid mean? It means more than one type of coating. And why we did this was we kind of wanted to do copper, right? So we were kind of bored with tin. I mean, I think there's a lot more you can do with tin, but we had this thing that said, let, copper's a challenge, let's do it. So obviously the first approach was why don't we cold spray copper onto the tin? And we tried it, but it didn't work. It just eroded uh, the tin. Now, I have to say that in the literature, I have found people who said they can cold spray copper onto the tin. I don't know if you guys have tried it, but we can't do it. If you've done it and you've, you've managed to do it, maybe you can let us know how you did it. But here, this is an example of a tin being too easy to erode using copper. So that didn't work for us. So what we then tried to do was we tried to electroplate the CFRP. So we can do this uh, by first laying down an electroless nickel or copper coating, but we, we did electroless nickel because the copper was, wasn't as good. So in order to do this, you have to activate the substrate. In this case, we use palladium. Then you do your electroless deposition of nickel phosphorus. We managed to get a five micron layer, which is too thin. If you try to cold spray that, it just disappears. So then we electro deposited a copper um, coating of about 100 microns. You actually still get erosion uh, of, of the coating. I mean, you, so this was to, to prevent erosion of the electroless nickel coating. But when you cold spray on top of this, you actually still get erosion of this coating. So in fact, after we cold sprayed, there was only about 50 microns of this coating left, but it worked. So you could cold spray copper onto this. And in fact, the deposition efficiencies were quite good. So we looked at uh, the electroplated CFRP and we compared it with cold spraying copper sheet, copper plate, basically. So this was done at 480 degrees centigrade. Again, low pressure. So you can see 0.4 to 0.45-ish. 
so it, so the deposition efficiencies are not too bad they're still lower than the tin ones but they're in that ballpark so quite good uh but it was surprising that the deposition efficiency on the copper plate wasn't very good at all it was you know very poor uh so um you might wonder uh why we don't go higher than 0.46 there didn't seem to be that much of improvement but could we have gone higher well when we went higher unfortunately we started getting delamination of the coating for reasons that we're not really clear about we think it might be due to heat management for which hard to explain but maybe that's a possibility so you can see a wrinkling of the coating here and when you look at the cross section you see that the the coating this is the electroplated coating next to the substrate and it's kind of really buckling uh, this is the um, cold spray copper coating you can see there's really no adhesion on that so this is kind of strange anyway that's why we didn't go above uh, 0.48 we're getting this really weird delamination effect and so when we were wondering why we get such a good uh, relatively good deposition efficiency or why is it relatively poor we finally thought that it was something to do with the uh, relative hardness so uh, you can see uh, that uh, the tin hardness is very low, so maybe that's why we get erosion of that when we cold spray it with copper. We find that the copper plate has got much higher hardness than the copper powder, whereas the plated copper is actually quite close uh, to the copper powder. And so we think uh, that that is why um, the electroplated copper has a better adhesion uh, with the copper powder because you can't you really need to have mutual deformation we think of the powder and the substrate it's it's not enough to concentrate all the deposition or the deformation in either the substrate or the uh, powder so that that's why we think there's such a disparity uh, between the deposition efficiencies of the plated copper and the copper panel uh, in terms of bond strength, uh, we did uh, several tests in order to look at uh, the adhesion strength. So we looked at the adhesion strength of the electroless nickel on the CFRP, uh, the electroplated and electroless nickel on the CFRP, and then the whole thing. So when we cold sprayed the copper, uh, let's see what happens. So when we looked at um, uh, the electroless nickel and the electroless nickel and cold uh, copper plated, uh, this is the um, uh, adhesion strength, and it and it was adhesive failure. So what this means is that when you electro deposit copper on the the electroless nickel, there's no effect on the adhesion strength, and not surprisingly, why should there be? And th these are the um, uh, adhesion strengths. This is the strength of the glue, so it didn't get near that. But unfortunately, when we did, uh, when we pulled, did the adhesion test for the whole thing, we got cohesive failure of the electro deposited copper, and the strength of the cohesive failure was much lower than the adhesive failure attributed to uh, the uh, coating substrate failure. So uh, this, we think, is because uh, the velocity is very low, and so that's co co giving us problems in terms of any sort of bonding in the coating. So if we look at the cohesive failure, and we look closely, we don't see any sign of dimpling. There's no sign of metallurgical bonding. And so, like I said, no metallurgical bonding, velocity is too low. And of course, if you go to, if you increase the velocity, then you'll probably start eroding uh, the electroplated copper coating a bit too much, and that might be a problem. But also, you start getting this delamination problem. That with, that's really the big problem right now, why we can't increase the velocity of the copper. 
Um, so then we, our final effort was to look at a hybrid coating where we actually finished off with electroplated copper. So we tried, we did this, we cold sprayed tin and then we electroplated copper on that. And at least you get um, a process step reduction. So you don't need to have the electroless nickel step, right? Uh, so was this any good? Um, well, this is the, uh, the tin coating. Uh, and it's it's a strange coating because we're seeing these kind of ripples which I never saw before, and these ripples are revealed even more when you do the cold spraying of the copper. But it works uh, the electroplating of the cut of the tin. I mean, pardon me, but it works. Of course, it would work. And this is just a more detail of that surface. So this is the uh, um, details of the um electroplated coating it's basically following uh, the substrate de the, de the details below it of the cold sprayed tin coating uh, unfortunately uh, the co again when you pulled the material uh, the without the the copper coating you got the uh, pretty good adhesive strength uh, it was as, more or less the same as what we got with the electroless nickel uh, coating and the substrate. But as soon as you electroplated the tin coating, it actually started failing cohesively. And the, uh, the cohesive strength was again very low. And this was kind of weird. So this is the uh, cohesive failure. And what you're seeing here is copper. So in fact, uh, the, the electroplated copper was actually electroplating internally in the, uh, in the tin coating. And we think this is because there's some connectivity of, uh, of the outside surface uh, to pores and voids within the tin coating. So to improve that, maybe we should try to get a better tin coating, which means maybe higher velocities or maybe we revert back to uh, the lower melting point thing to try to improve uh, the quality of the coating but you know these are the things that we are thinking about if we're going this route of electroplating tin on the plus side it really works in terms of electrical resistivity of course it would so this is the electrical resistivity of the cold spray tin. It's not, it's not as obviously not as good as the bulk tin, but it's not that far off. But obviously anything copper is much better than tin. So even the cold spray, uh, uh, the cold spray copper is, you know, not bad. Uh, but the electroplated copper is even better. It's very close to the bulk. So the, the hybrid approach where you're electroplating the, the tins doesn't sound like a bad idea at this point. So um, uh, just to summarize hybrid coatings, um, you, we couldn't uh, cold spray tin because it eroded it, but you can do a lot of other things with copper. Either you can cold spray it onto an electroplated surface or you can electroplate cold sprayed tin but unfortunately all the copper coatings fail cohesively at, at very low uh, strength levels but copper's great in terms of conductivity so that I, that I think finishes it off let's see if I've got any uh, things going on here uh, so do you think lower roughness by grip blasting yeah well hmm it might but I but I think the the problem with grit blasting is I always the grit so there's always going to be grit that's left even even in metals there's grit there and it's not it's not good for the adhesion and I think uh, the adhesion of uh, the coating on the polymer is already not that good so so I'm I'm kind of pessimistic about that and uh, and also it's not clear to me whether the damage is going to be is going to be too great but but this can be worked at so certainly i think um uh, a lower a finer grit material is worth looking at right uh, but 
when we looked at the ordinary grits, the coating quality was really horrible. So I'm not sure how much it will be better. I'm not sure whether it will be, you know, acceptable. So how, how to measure the adhesion strength? It's the, the ASTM method is just um, basically, you know, you, you glue uh, the, the coating onto the, onto the uh, anvils and then you pull it off. It is challenging. And what, one thing that we were doing was we were using a square uh, sections, which is obviously not ideal because the round ones avoid um, stress concentrations and things like that. But it wasn't too bad. But there, there are new there are new approaches to adhesion. And we we've been looking, uh, I think there's a, a method where you can uh, there's, there's a new piece of equipment where you don't have to do any gluing and and you just kind of pull on something and, and it looks kind of interesting. Um, we're, we're kind of looking at this four point bend method. I don't know if you've heard about it, but I, apparently there's a notched specimen that you coat. And then when you do a four point bend test, you monitor um, the load versus uh, crosshead movement. And I think you can see um, a detail happening uh, when when you get uh, decohesion or loss of uh, adhesion of the coating so but yeah the the adhesion strength thing is very challenging especially if um, the, the strength exceeds the glue strength then you don't know what's going on but right now with uh, with the polymer metal coatings we don't that's not our problem the problem is still trying to get kind of decent measurements anyway might pre oh <clears throat> yeah so preheating of polymers is an inter another interesting thing uh, now there you we would be thinking of uh, I I would like to think of things like the glass transition temperature and um, we know that uh, coating of thermoplastics is easier than coating of epoxies. So uh, the preheating of the substrate actually comes about in cold spray because, uh, it, for example, if you slow down the um, the traversing of the of the of the the gun, then you kind of automatically increase the heat of the substrate. Uh, so it definitely looks good in terms of thermoplastics. We haven't looked at it in terms of CFRPs, uh, but um, but unfortunately, thermosets aren't very amenable to softening. So I don't I don't think this is going to it's going to work. But we can certainly do the experiment of slowing down uh, the traversing of the gun so that it kind of automatically heats up the substrate and see what happens. But like I said. It's good for thermoplastics simply because there is a glass transition temperature. And I think that helps. But in terms of CFRPs, I'm not sure it helps. But I should say that I hear that uh, the uh, aerospace companies are interested in um, um, uh, thermoplastics. So instead of using epoxy as the polymer, um, using thermoplastics is a better idea. The only problem, it's better all around, but the problem is it's more expensive. So I don't think people, um, you know, there'll have to be something uh, to do in terms of, um, uh, I guess, cost. It's always cost. Anyway, so it's exactly eight, 9.30. Uh, so I, I, obviously I should be finishing there. I guess I hand it back to uh, Kazuhiro to, uh, I guess, finish the webinar. So, but thanks for listening and thanks for the questions. They were very, they were very challenging and very interesting. So thank you very much for that.